Good afternoon. I am Andrea Ferguson, and we are on The Shank Show. Today is a very special show because we have our guest, Dr. David Bequist from the University of Incarnate War Word, who is the director and founder of the Center for Medical Tourism. And of course, we have our lovely host, Mariana Mendez, and Kayla Liendo, also co-hosting. And today we're going to be talking about medical tourism. And our goal above all is that you, the viewer, would learn how to be a smarter, healthier, conscious healthcare consumer and not just a patient. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. But first, uh, Dr. Viquist, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? Oh, bien. Uh, buenos dias, by the way. So uh, thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. And um, the um, my background is that I uh, used to be a consultant and then worked uh, with HCA and one of their large facilities here in South and Central Texas, one of their healthcare systems. And from there, uh, dropped out and joined academia. And um, part of uh, going into academia is I needed to have a research agenda. And so I went with something that I knew and uh, developed a paper with a friend of mine who was a, a professor over at uh, St. Mary's University um, across the, the city from us. And uh, we did it uh, many years ago, uh, over a decade now, uh, about uh, medical tourism. And it turned out there wasn't many researchers focused on medical tourism. Uh, and I kind of continued to follow up on that and it just became a thing. Uh, so the, the, I, I have a little bit of a funny story, Andrea. I don't think I told you this story, uh, but it's, it's a great story about how I got into medical tourism as part of an introduction. So I, I did this article and the, um, the, the other professor from St. Mary's was uh, going to a conference in New Jersey. And so he wanted to present the, the paper there. I had a paper presenting at the same time in Las Vegas. So I was like, Las Vegas or New Jersey? And uh, sorry, uh, for those of you from New Jersey, I'm so sorry, but I decided to go to Las Vegas because it seemed like it'd be a little bit more fun. Uh, and so I ended up uh, being um, it was the lead writer for the paper. So um, after the paper gets uh, presented at this conference and it was on the website and things like that, I get contacted by a blogger. And at that time, you know, 10 plus years ago, bloggers were a pretty big deal. They were the influencers of today. And uh, so this blogger picks up my article, starts talking about it, asks me questions. And I, I'm kind of going, oh, this is pretty cool. And then that led to a blog about me, about my research I was doing when nobody else was doing research on medical tourism. And then a, a major conference in Washington, D.C. saw my blog and they called me up and they said, hey, we're looking for an expert on medical tourism. And there doesn't appear to be anybody, but you've got a blog about you. So you appear to be the only one. So we'd like to invite you to come up to Washington, D.C. and, and be the keynote speaker. And I was like, well, this is sweet. <laughs> and so I ended up going to Washington, D.C. And then I met somebody there and they were starting an, another uh, association, a conference. And they had one in San Francisco. And they they said, there's not many experts and you appear to be one of the only ones. How about we invite you to San Francisco and we'll pay for you to go to San Francisco? And I was like, sweet. I love San Francisco. And so I'm in San Francisco. And then uh, I gosh, I don't remember where it went from there. And then I get a call from the Filipino National Tourism Office. And they say, hey, we'd like you to come to the Philippines and spend several weeks there and meet with the president of the Philippines because you appear to be one of the few experts in medical tourism. I'm like, sweet. And they paid for everything. And so then I ended up uh, just literally for the past 10 to 12 years, it's been almost like a daze uh, because I, I get invited to go to all these incredible places around the face of the earth and continue to do this research. And each time I had to get smarter and better and collect more information. So I, I kind of lucked into it, but um, basically became one of the leading experts on a multi-billion dollar industry. And and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Well, that is incredible. I have so many questions and I'm sure Mariana and Kayla do too. But first I will allow them to introduce themselves and then we'll get rocking and rolling with questions. Okay. So hello everyone. 
I am Kayla Liendo, I am graphic designer and also medical content specialist in Shanks, and I'm really excited to record this show and also to have Dr. Bickles here today, and we, I know that we're going to learn a lot today. That was such a fascinating story, just to start <laughs> off with. <laughs> um, but hello, everybody. My name is Mariana. Um, I'm currently an intern at Shanks. I'm very excited to be part of this show. Very, very excited for the topic. Um, I've been looking forward to it since for weeks now. Um, so yeah, I'm really very excited to be here. Awesome. So Mariana, I know that you had a questioner so prepared, and uh, I think it's it's really timely. I think that medical tourism is is just going to explode. So why don't we get started with the questioner so that you have, and we'd love to foster some conversation around it. Okay. Uh, so my question is. Following the global crisis in 2020, numerous people traveled across international borders to seek better quality care for their respiratory symptoms. You estimated this trend would pick up in the following 18 to 24 months. What is the current standing of medical tourism now? Hmm. Yeah, muy importante uh, in terms of a question. It's a very... Um, very relevant because uh, what we've seen is basically a, a shutdown of travel across most of the world for many years. Um, during that period of time, interestingly, um, because of the fear of um, of you know catching um, a virus, what has happened is many people put off. Um, getting additional care. Uh, there's some suggestions in the literature that, for example, like one in five uh, cancer patients in, in uh, the UK didn't receive any care uh, during the during the period that they were locked down and unable to travel or in some cases uh, not able to go into hospitals and seek the care they wanted or, or stayed away from the hospitals because of fear of, of contagion. So it's really fascinating. That has uh, played a major role in, if you will, the health burden that has uh, been created in many countries, which already, and on, on, I was at an event a couple of years back with Andrea, and we, we were uh, talking about a white paper that talked about the, the upcoming healthcare apocalypse, which is particularly in the United States and many countries around the world, including places like Mexico. Um, Mexico has the uh, highest obesity burden um, of any country in the world, uh, the United States being number two. But the, the problem is we have very obese population, not a lot of people getting physical activity, not a lot of people um, eating the, the nutrient rich foods that they should be. Um, we also have uh, people putting off care now um, for the last few years. We have uh, the problems with lack of healthcare resources, particularly personnel. We've seen the great resignation and particularly that's impact on healthcare. Um, and then we have this increasingly um, just a very uh, perverse uh, problem of uh, mental health issues, which mm -hmm. um, uh, just in, particularly among the young has been such an issue and was only, if you will, exacerbated uh, by the events of the last few years. So mental health issues, obesity, not getting enough physical exercise, eating bad foods, um, the, the lack of healthcare resources, um, you know, increasingly uh, lack of access, if you will, uh, because of uh, personnel issues, it's creating a, a, a need, an unmet need, if you will. And so what we're finding is that one of the ways in which people are dealing with these unmet needs is by traveling across um, boundaries. And some of those boundaries may be, for example, here in the United States, maybe people leaving their city or town and going to another city or town or potentially leaving the county or leaving the state or even leaving the country and going somewhere and getting access to care. So that, that seems to be... Um, it was increasing, and in 2019 was a banner year in people traveling, particularly uh, internationally for healthcare, um, with this unmet need and the travel um, ish, uh, travel picking back up to uh, rates that we saw uh, pre uh, the last couple of years. Uh, we expect it to be uh, a banner year in, in medical tourism. 
So hopefully that answers a little bit of the question. Oh. Uh, yes, I think it was like, it's really interesting to see like how many insights from somebody that knows a lot about miracle tourism and how even the, to say like the most basic things, for example, like eating healthy and exercising that it's like basic needs of the human body and how people are still like looking for somebody who kind of like teaches them how to do that and take care, so take care of them. So that's really interesting. And I also have another question uh, here in our chart. We, we usually talk about uh, the primary care. So I want to ask a question regarding that and also, of course, medical tourism. And it's like one of the reasons why medical tourism is that health, that people are looking for healthcare and more affordable prices. So do you think that models like uh, direct primary care are like contributes to the rise of medical tourism? Okay, uh, so I'll, uh, two kind of questions there, a statement and a question. The first one, uh, just uh, give uh, a shout out to Andrea is um, also the kind of the queen of this because uh, I, I see her talking about this and posting about this and interested in this as well, is the, the whole thing about social determinants of health in terms of its impact on your health. If you look at the impact that physicians, doctors, pharmaceuticals, uh, actual medical procedures have on your health from a macro view, it's about 20% of your overall health. Um, the There's a big chunk, uh, which is upwards of 30%, which is your genetics, which means that you have predisposition towards cancer, as we saw, for example, a few years back with um, uh, Angelina, um, oh gosh, the actress. Mm -hmm. Jolie. Uh, Really, thank you. So I uh, forgot the last name for a second, uh, Elder Mo, um, it, where she was preemptively um, trying to prevent breast cancer, for example. Mm -hmm. um, that was a genetic issue. So genetics potentially plays upwards of a 30% role. So you're looking at about 50%, maybe at the most, um, that is genetics and uh, the role of your physician, your surgeon, um, the, the pharmacist that's prescribing you medications or, or uh, distilling, giving you the medications that have been, uh, you got a script for. The rest of it, upwards 50 plus percent is actually things like what types of behaviors do you engage in? So do you, um, if you have unprotected sex, do you have a greater chance of, of catching a disease, which could actually affect you um, in, a, in a very unfortunate way. If you don't exercise, uh, you know, the, one of the greatest predictors of longevity, particularly for elderly people is mobility people's ability to walk. So uh, foot speed, for example, has been correlated with longer life. So people that are able to get out there and actually walk and walk at a, at a vigorous pace are more likely to live longer. And we've seen some great things about uh, um, lifting weights and stuff like that. So all this stuff, uh, and Trey and I are, are big um, proponents of this, uh, are all factors in your overall health. Sorry, that was a long intro, but to that, that first point. So very big on that. And also, don't forget, nutrition, food is, is health. Uh, nutrition is, is a vital role. If you eat things that are bad for you, then it's going to affect you. Now, when it comes to the primary care, this is really fascinating. When it comes to medical tourism, medical tourism tends to be more specialty procedures than it does tend to be primary care. So uh, the role of healthcare in most countries around the world has typically been a local thing. In other words, you typically get your health from a local provider, uh, local facilities that are near you. And there's still a role for that. And uh, interestingly, um, during this last few years, when we saw um, under the Trump administration and extended under the Biden administration in the United States, um, expanded access to telehealth and telehealth in many countries around the world uh, tend to increase. When you ask people if they like telehealth, a lot of people say yes, but then you ask them the second question, which is you say, do you like telehealth better than meeting with your doctor in person? And the answer is no. Majority mm -hmm. of people say no. So they don't mind telehealth, but they don't see it as a substitute 
for actually meeting with your physician for think, for example, women saying, Hey, listen, you're going to be meeting with your OBGYN, but it's all going to be telehealth. And that's probably going to be troublesome, right? Cause the, for example, when you're doing breast exams yeah. and stuff like that, I mean, you could say, well, this is what I think I feel, but it's, it, unless you have um, an actual physician there to, to help. So can we be honest? Uh, primary care is still going to be local and most people are going to still want a person that they do. Now, when it comes to specialty care, so when the uh, primary care physician says you have a lump and you probably need to get that looked at by an oncologist, for example, this is where medical tourism becomes particularly acute and very uh, interesting for a lot of people is because do you want the person that is good or would you rather have somebody that's great? Do you have, want to have somebody look at your lump that potentially only looks at, say, you know, a couple of them a month versus somebody that looks at hundreds of them a month? And so in healthcare and particularly medicine, um, experience and volume matters. It's kind of like athletics. The more you do something, the better you get at it. And so physicians and surgeons that do something more often tend to be better at it. And there are certain places, usually in healthcare called centers of excellence, that tend to have more of these procedures done. Now, interestingly, and I'm getting to the finalizing that point uh, that, that you brought up, which is interestingly at the Centers of Excellence, um, organizations like the Leapfrog Group, which is an American think tank that looks at healthcare issues in the U.S., has found that Centers of Excellence, places of excellence that, that specialize in certain types of things, tend to be more efficient, faster, and better, which leads to, you ready for this, lower cost. So you combine this with the idea that certain countries, certain regions, certain cities um, have expertise and excellence in other places and combine that with potentially a lower um, cost of living. So for example, uh, a place like Mexico, um, as you see the question that just came up, a place like Turkey, um, of uh, places that, uh, for example, uh, that have excellence in like Korea or Singapore or Malaysia, places in Asia, people find out about these, these wonderful procedures that can be done and they look for what Dr. Michael Porter from Harvard calls value. They don't just look at cost. Interesting medical tourists are typically not looking at cost, they're looking at value. So to address the, the question that came up, which is a fantastic question about uh, medical systems in, in Turkey. Uh, I've, been, I've been very fortunate to have made several trips into Turkey, which is a beautiful country. It sits there right, um, right on the Mediterranean. Um, and Istanbul itself, the city is actually half of the city is in Europe and half the city is in Asia. It's the only city to sit on two continents. They have some fantastic health care and they have a lot of regions around them that are looking for, um, if you will, better value on health care. So you have Europeans that come into uh, Turkey for a variety of procedures, including cosmetic procedures. Then you have people in the Middle East and the Gulf states, uh, which by the way, are having uh, major um, health issues. For example, they have uh, rampant low fertility rates. They have uh, issues uh, with diabetes um, that is uh, based on lifestyle issues. And then they're also right there next to North Africa and the entire African continent, which has over a billion people on it and is increasingly having access to money there's been economic um, growth in Africa, but they don't have a lot of good health care. And so Turkey's just become this, this phenomenal place uh, where you have this kind of existence of, of good health care. By the way, uh, anybody know? I would, have, I would have never known that. And I think I speak for uh, not just myself, but a lot of people who assume, oh, Turkey, I don't know about the system there. But they also said the same thing about Cuba too, right? Oh, Cuba. And then it comes out, come to find out that they were forced to be self-reliant and dependent and innovators because of the embargo. And there are so many people that I even know that go there to study medicine and they're Americans. 
stay there for seven years. So I think you bring such a valid analysis of what it means in the different categories that exist, that the ways that you rate uh, quality or the rate, like how do you, what are people traveling for? What are they really seeking? Uh, uh, what, you know, giving them alternatives and seeing like, cause that, that's one of my questions is like, when you look at the center of excellence, when you look at how you're rating uh, who's got the best healthcare system, how do you actually do that? What are the oh. methods and, and what Gosh. determines who's, who's amazing and who is failing? <laughs> oh, that, that's such a terrific question. And, 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 and it's one that we've juggled um, and, and, and debated and looked at for all these years. Um, the first thing you have to understand is that healthcare is extremely complex and that it's extremely complicated. Um, I know that sounds like simplistic statements, but let me explain. Um, in the United States, um, you'll hear Europeans sometimes talk about the fact that we have uh, lower longevity rates uh, in the United States than they do in certain countries in Europe. But you have to look at things, for example, as we talked about the social determinants of health, for example, it's not well known, but Americans tend to drive a lot more miles than Europeans. So uh, some of the mm -hmm. countries that have the longest longevity rates, they live longer, tend to be places like Korea, Japan, Switzerland, places like that. Well, yeah, have, you ever, have you ever been to those countries? They don't drive as often. And uh, an interesting point uh, back in, say, the 1500s, people would look at the 1500s and look at uh, life expectancy, and they would say, well, people only have life expectancy of 35. Well, it's not exactly correct. The, it's, the average is correct, but you have to have an understanding of statistics to know that the reason that the average was 35 is because infant deaths, uh, infant mortality rates were so high. And so the chance of a child dying between uh, zero and say three, four or five years old was very high. So because infant mortality is so high, and from a statistic standpoint, when you add a bunch of zeros to a number, it tends to drag the number down. So it turns out if you live to be like 25, 30 years old in the middle um, middle ages, you had a, a very good chance of living to be 60 years old. So people were old. I mean, Aristotle and people like that uh, so, uh, we're going to have very long lives, um, and they did have very long lives. People did live in ancient times to ancient, to older ages. It's just that the average was low because of infant mortality rates. So in the United States, sorry, long explanation, but in the United States, uh, because we drive a lot of miles here in Texas, my gosh, we, we all know what that means. Um, because people drive a lot of miles, and the typically the number one um, – cause of death for people between the age of, uh, you know, from 16 to um, 20 some years old is motor vehicle injuries and accidents. Uh, it's a big cause of death here in the United States. And so actually, if you take those numbers out, along with the injuries that occur to children that are involved in um, accidents as well, if you take those out and you normalize those compared to uh, Japan or Switzerland or places like that, the United States raises to the top of life expectancy ratings. It's we're part of the numbers. It's 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 a statistical issue. Mm -hmm. But what makes healthcare great? Um, that's a great question, Andrea. Um, I think you have to look at the uh, the actual medical procedures and the efficacy of the me medical procedures. For example, in the United States, we have some of the best cancer survival rates, both five and 10 years um, in the world. And so that is um, uh, why we see literally tens of thousands of people coming into the United States on an annual basis uh, to be able to get access to various different places. For example, go to the Texas Medical Center in Houston or MD Anderson or the Cleveland Clinic or John Hopkins. Um, so uh, that that's probably the sign of greatness, but it isn't at a country level. It's down to probably a regional or at a facility level. Sorry, long answer. Awesome. Well, we had a couple of comments come in. Um, you spoke to one of them about the, the, the medical tourism system in Turkey. And then we have uh, 
I own a clinic in Antalya, Turkey. And the topic is intriguing. Thank you, Dr. V. And then we have, despite all preconceived notions people have about medical tourism in Turkey, it's one of the few countries with regulations specifically drafted for medical tourism. And so I compare that to all of the regulatory, all of the red tape that we have here in the U.S. And I, I just want to know if there were any particular country that we could seek to draw some inspiration from or think, hey, this model works really well here. Do you have an idea of what that would be? And before you answer that question, I also want to ask you, um, do you have any idea what the top maybe three, four, five countries of travel destination worldwide for medical tourism would be? So there's uh, there's a lot of controversy in that. I'm going to answer the second question first. A lot of controversy in that because uh, sometimes the national numbers are have the ability to be inflated. For example, uh, when you're receiving medical tourists and they receive multiple procedures. So uh, I was in the Dominican Republic, uh, which sees a lot of Americans for plastic surgery. But then afterwards, people make the trip to a rehab center to stay for a few days where they sit on the beach and drink Mai Tais while they, uh, you know, relax and um, uh, get better from or let the swelling go down from the cosmetic surgery. Does that count as two procedures? No, it, it's, it, it is two procedures, but is it two patients? And the answer is no. So we, we see a lot of numbers out there that, that are difficult to parse through and come up with the right answer. In general, I can tell you some of the top destinations in the world tend to be places like, and one of the ones that many people know about, and the number one destination for most Africans, and we have uh, empirical evidence to support that, is India. Uh, we also know that uh, there are several destinations in Asia that are getting large numbers of patients, and we have some empirical data to support that, including, for example, Korea and Malaysia and Singapore and Thailand. They all uh, get large numbers of, of patients. Here in the Americas, we have uh, some very formidable destinations as well. The United States is a medical tourism destination. And um, the, the, we're not completely sure, but we think that um, the even though there's more Americans probably go outside the U.S. than people come inside, we're still a, a very major destination for people trying to get health care. Um, here in San Antonio, for example, we see Mexican nationals coming into the city to get access to care from our hospitals. So uh, Mex uh, both the United States and Mexico, Mexico is a huge destination. It's getting potentially a million Americans a year. In fact, we just had a CDC study that just came out last year that looked at uh, data from 2016 in a survey. And they found out that about 1.3% of all Americans Americans are traveling outside the country for healthcare. It's not a lot compared to other countries. For example, Canada, um, the, the amount of people traveling is probably closer to 3% based on some numbers that their think tanks put together. And in the Europe, uh, it's about 4% of all Europeans travel across borders in Europe. Um, in terms of other destinations uh, in the Americas, Colombia, uh, Dominican Republic, Costa Rica also get. Then when you start going um, uh, back over towards Europe, uh, Germany uh, tends to bring in medical tourists. Um, the UK brings in medical tourists, but not necessarily for the reasons you would think. A lot of times people go there to get free health care because they can present at an NHS hospital and um, just basically get access for care for free. In fact, there's an old African saying, uh, London is a good place to die. Uh, and the, the idea is if you have a really severe injury, really severe illness, you can go to London and basically present in an NHS hospital and get access to care. And then going down, we have uh, several places in North Africa that have developed. Uh, probably one of the major destinations in that region is Turkey. Jordan, surprisingly, um, the Dead Sea. You've been to a mall and seen these Dead Sea products? Um, yes. Jordan's uh, suggested at one point in time that upwards of, I think it was like four to 10% of their entire economy, their GDP is made up of tourism to the Dead Sea because they have a variety of resorts and a variety of products that come from the Dead Sea. And it's quite the destination. 
And then um, the places that people don't expect, for example, Iraq, um, uh, excuse me, Iran, not Iraq, sorry. Iran um, has a, uh, uh, a large number of people that go there for a variety of procedures, um, including, for example, sex change procedures. That's a whole other story in Iran. Um, so there, there's um, a number of top destinations, but I think I covered most of them uh, with that. So I'm sorry, back to the first question. That was the second question. Back to the, the first question was, remind me. I'm sorry. Hey, remind me. Yeah, I'm sorry. I went a little <laughs> second question. Uh, I, think, I think the first question was, uh, you know. About what, implementing, uh, like taking things from different systems and oh, taking yeah. aside inspiration for implementing. Yeah, so what would I pick? I would keep her around. I knew she would yeah. know it. What, what would you pick? And actually, the, the, I remember kind of what the first question was now. I'm so sorry. Um, the One of the things that's interesting is we find that people uh, and have an interview coming out in uh, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society's uh, magazine, which is one of the top pharmaceutical magazines in the world, have an interview coming up about pharmaceutical tourism. Um, which interestingly, I was interviewed, and Andrea, you can uh, pull up one, one or two of those, um, uh, that was a big deal um, uh, during the, the last um, a couple of years where people were actually traveling for vaccines, say from places in Latin America and Mexico into the United States to get access to vaccines here in Texas. And we actually saw numbers at the border and that was reported in, um, uh, this is a article in La Reforma, which is the largest newspaper in Mexico. And I also had uh, another interview that came up in El Dia, which is a Spanish language, um, Dallas Morning News. So um, people traveling for pharmaceuticals. The In pharmaceutical travel, this is interesting. Andrea mentioned, for example, Cuba. People can sometimes go into the Caribbean and into Latin America and get access to pharmaceuticals that have been um, allowed in those countries prior to being allowed in the United States. Uh, the In Latin America um, and in the Caribbean, particularly the European states within the Caribbean, they, they have a, typically about a seven-year process for pharmaceuticals to be accepted, where here in the United States is about 10-year cycle. And even in places like India, it's even less. So uh, when it comes to pharmaceutical treatments, for example, a new pharmaceutical treatment for cancer, it may not be available in the United States first. It may be available, believe it or not, in the Caribbean before it's available in the United States. So some people would say that would be something that you would want to bake into a perfect healthcare system. Um, the other thing, it's an interesting aspect, and this is something that Andrea and, and Shanks and the company um, do a lot of work in, is we find that a lot of the medical tourism trends and a lot of the medical tourism efforts tend to be in private facilities. Uh, and there's, there's really good uh, empirical data to support that. And the, a couple of things come into play. There was a, a very large empirical study of millions of medical records in Chile, and they found that people that went to private facilities versus public facilities and had the same doctors. In Chile, if you're a doctor, you have to practice in the public, but then you have the option to practice in private as well. And although you know the doctors trying to do their best for both populations, in the public facilities, people with their, um, the outcomes that they would get would be slightly less than they were in the private facilities. And one of the suggestions of the researchers that looked at this in a huge sample size was they suggested that the difference is that the doctor has to work very, very hard in the private facility to get good recommendations, to get good word of mouth, to get good social media um, coverage in these private facilities, where in the public facilities, they, they, they don't 
right? Because everybody hates them and they just go to them because they have to go to them or they have no choice. Where in the private facility, you're paying for it. And so you, you really want to have a good physician and good care. And if you don't, then you don't go back to it. And then you as a physician don't get returned patients. The hospital doesn't get people coming back. And they re they tell the, the hospital, hey, that doctor was lousy. So you really, the, in the point is incentives matter. And we found that incentives matter. So um, if right, I was. I mean, well, yeah. we, uh, we want to invite you back on the show. Actually, we have stolen Shankar Slot, who usually at this time at one o'clock ish will, will, would speak with you on Thursdays. But we would love to do this again in August and talk to you about pharmaceuticals and as it relates to medical tourism, pick your brain, go over your article that was recently published and or will be published. Um, because we know like one of the things from the San Antonio Free Market Medical Association, uh, I think last year, we talked about how uh, roughly 90% of APIs, which are active pharmaceutical ingredients, go into the drugs that most people take every single day. And they're ma manufactured in the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. And so I really want to get your perspective on what this does and what would be an ideal situation and how medical tourism even plays into all of that uh, with, with pharmacy. So yeah. we will definitely uh, schedule a time. And uh, we just thank you so much, Dr. Bequist, for being on the show with us. I think we have so much content to glean through and we will uh, just have to post your articles. And um, again, thank you so much for lending us your time and al allowing us to know more about this topic. Um, as Kayla is in Venezuela, you know, maybe if you're down there, we can have a show there too. That would be amazing. Um, but yeah, so we're gonna we're going to thank everyone else who was here on the call with us. Um, Mar Marilia Silva, Christian El Cori, Ace Jenin, I believe, and uh, Asia Kadar, and and everyone is thanking us for this event. So again, we'd love to have you back. And uh, thank you, Mariana and Kayla and Dr. V. And we yep. will see you in August. Yeah. And also I'll be um, down in Mexico here very soon and also probably in Colombia and Dominican Republic uh, later this year. So uh, hopefully you get to see you all there. And thank you for all the, the people that uh, were following and asking questions. Appreciate your, your attention so much. And also please keep us posted on what you discover. It's, it's, it's wild, the research that we find online versus you know, all of these revelations really getting down and seeing, okay, what, what is this factor controlling it? Is it, it should be even include it, you know, two people, is it two people? It's just one person, two different procedures. You know, the general public is not coached to think this way. And that's the whole goal of our program is to help people understand. You need to understand this before you just take whatever uh, you can get. And then you spend a lot of money on it or you're not even really looking at the value and the quality. So that is our goal uh, with, uh, we call it Direct Care Español. And um, yeah, so we will love to see you back. And I don't know if Mariana or Kayla, you have anything else you'd like to say before we go? Uh, the, just that it was a really interesting episode. And like Andrea said, it's really nice to see and to understand how things really work. And thank you so much for joining us. I really enjoyed your detailed explanations. I actually learned a lot that I I wasn't aware of before. It was really, really awesome to have you on. We hope to have you back again. No problem. All right. Well, Mucho well, gusto, uh, all, all our Spanish viewers. So thank you. <laughs> Gracias. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Yes.